Okay. Morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And I like, would like to thank Tour for the wonderful talk before us. And I'm Anatoly Knazev, and with me is Mr. Timothy Anakin, and we're from the Bitcoin Fund, United States. We represent big and boring, according to Tour. Yours truly. So the first thing we're going to talk about, and we should mention in the context of the Bitcoin Fund, is that this is not an offer to invest. This is an example of one of the things that Tour was talking about, how to invest in Bitcoins. And more particularly, the Bitcoin Fund US is, is an example of how access to Bitcoins is being facilitated beyond people who are familiar with flash drives, e-tokens, encryption schemes, international bank transfers, Mt. Gox, whatever the hell that is, and a whole bunch of other concepts that are difficult for your aunts, uncles, grandmothers, brothers and sisters to understand. So, there's a little disclaimer. Please speed read it. There will be a test. You will not be allowed to leave the room until you answer seven questions correctly. How does it work? It's a fund. I should say, based on the various folks who have visited our stand, it's not a private equity fund. It is not a venture capital fund. It is not a seed fund. It is a fund that people invest in. A standard investment fund. The key, the key to remember is one share in the Bitcoin fund US is equal to one Bitcoin. Anatoly will talk more extensively about how difficult that was able, uh, how difficult that was to achieve in the context of a standard fund structure, but it's very important to understand that. Who can invest? Well, for various reasons related to the SEC and US government regulations, there are two primary criteria. The first criterion, 100 grand. The second criteria is you have to be what's called in the financial community a QP, a qualified purchaser. You have the concept of accredited investor, it's a million dollars in assets, including your house. You have the concept of qualified purchaser, it's five million dollars of investment assets. Unfortunately, for various legal reasons, we're restricted to that, at least at the moment. In order to provide this service, there is a small fee involved, which is for each transaction, zero point, or each entry into the fund, investment to fund, 0.5%. Thereafter, the fund functions like a currency fund. And if from a legal perspective, Bitcoin were considered a currency, the fund is considered, or would be considered a currency fund. Let's say, for instance, you want to invest in the South African Rand. There are two ways of doing that. You can open an FX account, transfer your money to the FX account, and then purchase RAND, with or without leverage, depending on how you want to approach that investment. The other way of buying RAND is to buy shares in a RAND fund, and it will have a similar structure. You invest money in the fund, that fund buys RAND. You want to redeem your investment, the fund sells RAND and gives you your money back. It's an easier way of doing it. It doesn't involve opening a new account. It doesn't involve wearing money. It doesn't involve understanding a whole other market. And if that sounds similar, it's exactly why there are trillions of dollars invested in currency funds today instead of being invested in currencies. And that's really the same thing we're proposing to do. Importantly, the most important aspect to continue the match of one fund share to one Bitcoin is there's no management fee and there's no success fee. So if you're familiar with hedge funds, and people in this part of the world generally are, there's often a 2 and 20 structure, a 2% management fee, a 20% success fee. That means by definition, if the underlying asset increases, the value of the investment will increase less because there's this haircut every time. There is no such haircut. There are no fees associated with this fund other than a 0.5% load, if you would like to call it that, to cover operational costs. And with that, Anatoly will explain why we need such a structure. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, I'm pretty sure a lot of you, maybe at least a lot of you, technically savvy guys and girls, have purchased bitcoins through exchange or locally with cash directly without any kind of a proxy hedge fund. And you have a question naturally. So why does the world need a hedge fund to invest in bitcoin to begin with? Well, there are several groups of reasons. I'll start with the ones that are unique to Bitcoins. And firstly, it's really easier to have an account with our fund than to buy Bitcoins on an exchange, especially 
if you are a high net worth or institution. So we can process your application for an account in a matter of hours. And as soon as we do the AML and KYC procedures, you are good to send in the monies. And they will usually, will usually hit our accounts actually the same day or the next day if you use a decent bank from the United States. And as soon as they hit our account, you are good to go. You are good to buy the shares of a fund. We give you immediate market access. No need to wait any longer. So it usually takes two days to actually start receiving the price appreciation of Bitcoin or depreciation. We are able to give you immediate market access because we, as a large player, have great relationships with the exchanges, all the major of them. So we, me personally, are the guys from our team, visit them in person, we speak with them, we explain our business, we learn about their business, we do our credit checks, we establish credit limits on them, and we trade. And as soon as we get the physical coins, we transfer them to our, to our cold storage. We use all of the state-of-art precautions to make sure that the physical coins are safe and secure. So we have a cryptographically proof uh, sound scheme utilizing two out of three secret sharing. It is geographically distributed between Europe, Russia, and Asia. And only the three managers of a fund have access, me being one of them. I reside in Singapore, for example. So the physical coins are safe, and that's our main focus. Last but not least, Unlike some Bitcoin providers, you know, guys, you can actually call us like the old fashioned way over the phone. You don't need even internet access for this. And you can do that 24 7 because we have teams again in Singapore, in Russia, in Europe, and here in the States. In fact, in San Francisco. The GP of a fund is in San Francisco. So, that about the Bitcoin related unique proposition. And team will follow with the, some other advantages and disadvantages we have so far. Tim? The biggest advantage for a company or for a legal entity, whether it be a fund, whether it be a fund of funds, an investment company, an asset manager, or just a company that for some reason wants to invest in Bitcoins, want to put, ca put cash in Bitcoins. In this room yesterday, there was a presentation of accounting software, an add-on to accounting software that lets Bitcoins get treated as, for accounting purposes as a currency. The problem is there's no legal basis for that yet in the United States or any place else. What do you put on your balance sheet? Is it a commodity? Is it a security? Is it some kind of currency? Indeed, we would all probably vote for currency here, but the rest of the legal system hasn't got up to that. So if you put Bitcoins on your balance sheet, how do you explain that to your accountant? How do you explain that to your auditor? How do you explain that to shareholders? How do you explain that to any regulatory body? What the hell do you have on your balance sheet? Nobody knows. And whatever you say, you can't prove it. So instead, you put on shares of a fund. We follow with respect to creating the U.S. feeder fund, especially the U.S. feeder fund, the ant principle. We want to look like another ant in line with all the other ants so no one pays any special attention to us. Your capital gains are from a, selling shares in a fund. Great. Everybody knows what that is. The IRS agent goes on to the next guy he wants to audit, and you're done. So the idea is to make this very simple, standard, and look like any other sort of similar investment. Secondly, if you buy Bitcoins yourself, unless you're addicted to, to Jolt Cola and can stay in front of the, your computer 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you're going to miss something. As Anatoly said, we have teams in three different continents basically covering all time zones. If something big happens, if Mt. Gox decides to shut down for a couple hours again, if somebody, some other event happens that, you, that happens to occur when you're, it's midnight your time or three in the morning your time, whenever you choose to sleep, you can, you can get informed. We'll be happy to wake you up at 3 in the morning with a phone call saying, uh-oh, you got to do something here. So you have a support team monitoring events in the market, which you don't have if you buy Bitcoins yourself. Also, we've talked about QPs and fairly large amounts of money have to be invested in this, but the Bitcoin market is fairly illiquid, which means you can move it. So if you place an order on Mt. Gox, Mt. Gox or any place else, I want to buy $2 million worth of Bitcoins, even half a million dollars worth of Bitcoins. Odds are you're going to move the market. 
And if you're putting a significant amount of money in, the market is going to move, obviously, against you. So what you want to do is phase in, the same logic for coming out. If you suddenly dump $2 million of the Bitcoins on the market, excuse me, you're also going to move it. You don't want to do that. What that means is, again, you have to babysit your computer, babysit the share price, and exit on the various trades that you can hit, assuming you can hit them. It may take you weeks or months to be able to pull out in a regular or go in in a, in a normal fashion without moving the market. Here it's easy. You tell us, I want to put in $1.5 million. When it's there, you give us a target price, and we have teams of people that will work to get that target price for you. They will not exceed that target price, either on the way in or on the way out. So it's a, it's a very different paradigm in terms of solo trading. Now, there are some disadvantages to a fund structure. Obviously, there are some costs involved. But from our perspective, the biggest advantage was, until last week, there was no 24-hour trading. This train is moving very fast. Tuva talked about a, a bullet going by. Well, as of last Friday, we now have 24-hour electronic trading. So you can actually uh, trade any place, any time, 24 hours a day. The other disadvantage still exists, although technically it doesn't have to. In other words, if you invest in a fund and a fund has some underlying assets, many funds, perhaps even most funds, have an option to distribute in, to make in-kind distributions. In other words, you put in money, the fund bought South African Rand, you want to get your money back, but you want to get it back in the form of South African Rand. So you have a distribution of in-kind. In Technically, the U.S. feeder fund and the master fund, and Anatoly will get to that shortly, can distribute in bitcoins. But as a practical matter, we've not implemented it, and I'm not sure we're going to implement it, implement it in the near future, because from a regulatory standpoint, from a tax standpoint, from an international currency standpoint, it's a very difficult thing. It's an uncertain thing to implement. So right now, you cannot get in-kind distributions from the fund in bitcoins. If you invest in dollars, you have to pull it out in dollars. So that's the structure of the fund and why we need it. Now, Anatoly came up with this idea of how to, uh, of coming, of developing a bitcoin fund and offering a bitcoin fund. And he's the one who went through the pain and suffering of setting up the master fund. And I'll let him tell you about the bumps he ran into along the way. Thank you, Tim. Well, in the current world, ideas are pretty much worthless, or some say have negative value. So we, I won't be, wouldn't be able to pull it off without all of our 60 plus guys working together and my partners like Tim and others present at the conference. So um, I'd like to share a personal experience of what bumps we've encountered on this road, what troubles we had to solve to actually make this cool product we're speaking about. And um, when we started thinking about the fund, we're going to structure it as a regular old-fashioned hedge fund. That is, the kind of fund when you send in the money, say, today on the 19th, you receive the shares on the 1st of June. And the exact price of bitcoins purchased for you is determined actually by the market fluctuations plus the actions of the investment manager, us. So that's a really easy way to do it. But I was persuaded by my partners to do it the other way. And now we restructured the memorandum so that one share of a fund represents exactly one BTC. And it turns out it was a great decision. It's really easy to explain the idea of a fund. It's really easy to sell. It's really easy to track the price of your investment. So that's nice. We started operating this fund six months ago in Europe and Asia. And we started receiving inquiries from the States almost immediately. But we couldn't service them because the people in the United States cannot invest in the foreign funds. So we had to set up a feeder fund here. It's a limited liability partnership in Delaware, which receives US dollars here in the States and sends them to a foreign fund, which actually does the trading. Again, as Tim said, we want to be as much an end as possible, similar to all the other structures out there, so we don't get any unnecessary attention. So that's the master feeder structure. To put things in perspective, setting up the original fund took us maybe four months, and we expected the United States to be actually more complicated. Turns out, the United States has a pretty efficient legal system, and we were able to pull it off in just a month and a half. So we spent four months on the initial fund and short of two months on the U.S. fund. And as you 
No, no, we did our homework. We are fully legally and tax compliant here in the States and everywhere in the world. We put a lot of effort in this. And the fees we charge are actually in line with what other Bitcoin service providers charge. So we had to figure out how to actually make money of this. Because the 0.5% fee, actually, to be honest, just covers the operational expenses of the fund as they are right now. And we decided, OK, we're somewhat early -ish adopters, started looking at Bitcoin a couple of years ago. So if this fund just drives the price up, it will benefit of us enough to justify doing it in the first place. And obviously, it will benefit everyone in this room. So that's the business model. And this slide, <laughs> thank you guys. It's not a non-profit, obviously. I'm not against businesses for profit. And this slide I had to add actually yesterday. As Tim mentioned, we have an online real-time trading going on. And I'm lucky to have my laptop here because I'll be able to showcase our software, which we created for that purpose. Uh, it doesn't maybe look that great through the projector, but feel free to stop by our booth and have a look at how it works. It's a fine piece, piece of software. It works on Windows, Mac, and Linux. We have the market debts. The market makers provide the liquidity, so they provide bidirectional quotes in the shares of a fund. And when their quotes are hit, they hedge their exposure with physical Bitcoin somewhere else outside of this platform. So investors in the fund can either trade over the phone or through this platform. That's cool, I guess. So we've talked about the present, the past. Let team cover the future, I guess. Thanks, Anatoly. So we know where it came from. We know why we have it. We know generally how it works. What are our future plans? Well, we left this in just because the feeder fund is about a week old, and that's our latest development. Obviously, the timing of that, we wanted to get it up and running before this conference. That was very important for us for obvious reasons. We would like to do, call it a classic ETF. The master fund is traded on an exchange in Europe, and it can be traded on a daily basis. It technically has an NAV that's monthly, but there's a secondary market. So to the investors who are allowed to trade on that fund, and that is, it's actually the same thing, sort of the European equivalent of a QP, for those sort of investors, it already is, who can trade in Europe, but it already is an ETF. But here we're talking about a classic ETF that would be open to more retail level investors. The disadvantage of that is there are more costs involved, and as a result of that, the fee structure has to be different. We're thinking about how best to work that out, again, to give the general public easier access to Bitcoins, not so much for spending as for saving or investing. The other aspect we're looking at is a trading fund. Now, as you know, there are, as I'm sure most of you know, there, it's possible to short Bitcoins. It's possible to do a little bit of derivative trading in Bitcoins, but you have ex excessive counterparty risk. You have very little market depth and liquidity, and it's not, the, those markets aren't efficient. They're slow. So it's not really something that you can use effectively to create a classic hedge fund using the definition, the strict definition of the word hedge. As the market develops, as it broadens and deepens, it will become more practical to trade in Bitcoins as you trade in a currency, as you trade in a commodity, or even in stocks, if you're shorting stocks or doing options or index trading. So that's another direction we would move, and that would be a separate vehicle. It would not be just a straight-up currency fund. The last thing we're looking at doing is because we have almost 100,000 Bitcoins in the master fund, is acting as a source of liquidity and a counterparty for other people's transactions, so potentially doing short or derivative transactions where we would act as a source of Bitcoins. Again, it's not something, that's, the, some, that's an aspect of this which is furthest in the future because of the potential risks involved in that given a very shallow, uh, shallow market, a very new market, and as of today, compared to most other markets, a very inefficient market. That's the future, that's what we're looking at, uh, considering doing. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Keep in mind, this is not an offer to invest. You have to answer the questions before you can leave. And if you have any questions for Anatoly or myself, please feel free to ask them. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, 
that was a fascinating uh, presentation. Thank you so much. I was looking forward to this uh, on the schedule for the last You're couple welcome. of days. I was very much interested in, uh, my son wants to join me here, I was very much interested in uh, what you were talking about in terms of cashing out. I mean, it's similar to, hold on for a second, buddy, uh, a gold ETF, you of have, course. We have two speakers. You can have two questioners. That's <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, a gold ETF, for example, I think uh, you, you made the uh, uh, analogy uh, perhaps with a commodity ETF where, you know, the expectation is you could cash out in gold. Uh, a lot of these that by contract, you could have cashed out by gold somewhere in Switzerland now. Oh, by the way, it's now cash because we don't actually have the gold in our fund and a lot of the gold uh, price manipulation is because paper gold ETF. Well, they only have 1% of the gold actually in the fund. So just to be clear, and I think you made it clear, but just for my own clarity's sake, uh, that 1% uh, or excuse me, the one share per one Bitcoin, when you put, do put it in cold storage, there is the Bitcoin there, yeah. right? There's not going to be yeah, this exactly. like, paper mythological Bitcoins, right? If actually you look at the list of the largest Bitcoin wallets, we are the second one. And the amount of coins we have is 97,000 something. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty easy to figure out if we are keeping our promise or not. And right. we're being very transparent from the very beginning and with the fees and the cold storage and everything. Okay. Thank you very much. That You're was welcome. Jade, go ahead. Why do we have to ask the questions before we can leave? <laughs> you don't have to ask them, you have to answer them. Ah, okay. It's like grade school, what can I tell you? <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you for the party yesterday. Ah, yes, I hope you enjoyed our party yesterday evening. Thanks very much. <laughs>